I'm Ralph McInerney, and this is a uh, brief course uh, in moral philosophy, an introduction uh, to moral philosophy. We're going to be spending uh, eight hours uh, on this uh, particular subject. And before I indicate to you, uh, you will have the syllabus, before I indicate to you what the uh, subjects of those eight lectures are, I want to say something about the aegis under which uh, I am doing this. Uh, you may have seen on EWTN a series uh, called Out of the Mind of the Church, uh, in which I discussed, uh, among other things, uh, the document of John Paul II, Ex Corde Ecclesiae, Out of the Mind of the Church, uh, in which the Holy Father discussed uh, the nature of a Catholic university and the assumptions uh, that the Church has as to what uh, Catholic universities uh, will do. It is sometimes considered to be problematic uh, nowadays to speak of a Catholic university, but it's always well to remind ourselves that the original universities were Catholic universities. If we date universities from the beginning of the 13th century, uh, as we ought to if we want to be historically accurate uh, in placing uh, perhaps the first university at Paris and then they just mushroom all across Christian Europe, they're all ecclesiastical institutions so that uh, we can uh, consider the modern, the contemporary situation uh, as either a uh, uh, decline from that happy state of affairs or I suppose some people consider it to be uh, uh, a, uh, a growth uh, from that, uh, those uh, modest uh, beginnings. Uh, the Holy Father is reminding us that uh, when it comes to uh, Catholic universities, what is essential is not simply uh, that uh, worship should take place there and that uh, the students and the faculty should become aware, should be made aware of their responsibilities uh, to their fellow man. Uh, those are terribly important things, essential to being a Christian but uh, they're accidental to what it is to be a university. A university is chiefly and principally concerned with the mind and the imagination. And what a Catholic university ought to do is to show the influence of the faith on the works of the imagination and the works of, uh, of the mind. And indeed, uh, if we uh, consider Western culture uh, over uh, as it developed uh, through the Christian uh, eras, uh, it's almost indistinguishable. Uh, from the faith. That is the motivation out of which it came. Uh, the writers, the uh, thinkers, uh, uh, the artists were animated by their, by their religious faith. So if, if you had any, uh, any doubt as to whether or not the religious belief is, re is relevant uh, to these endeavors, uh, the endeavors of the imagination uh, and of the mind, all one need do is look at Western civilization uh, and uh, have his mind uh, put at rest. One of the things that uh, has to be taken into account when we are reminded of the uh, church's expectations uh, for Catholic colleges and universities is that these expectations are regularly thwarted. Uh, it is, uh, it's a matter of um, agonizing uh, self-reflection uh, on uh, the campuses of almost all of our Catholic universities. There are people, many people, colleagues of mine, for example, who feel that we're evolving beyond that and, and we're moving into uh, the, uh, the uh, mode in which universities were meant to exist that is a secular mode, separated from religious faith and other such trappings uh, of, of the past. Uh, this, is, uh, this is in many ways unfortunate because uh, we send our children to Catholic colleges and universities and the expectation uh, that something will be done there that isn't done uh, on secular campuses. It would be unrealistic to expect it to be done on secular campuses. So it is, it's a matter of great concern, or it should be a matter of great concern, if we find on our Catholic campuses a secularizing of the very essence of what a university is, that is, of the mind and the imagination. If in our classrooms, on our stages, in our museums, uh, we, we have uh, activities and, uh, and uh, artifacts and so forth which are indistinguishable from those that we might find uh, in, on any other campus. The question arises, why should there be a Catholic university? Now many of us have been uh, talking about this and uh, expressing concern about this. There are many uh, universities uh, that drifted off uh, in, in the direction that I'm indicating and then have firmed up and have started back.
There have been any number of new institutions that have been founded uh, to confront uh, this issue. Uh, Thomas More College, uh, Christendom College, Thomas Aquinas College. Uh, these are efforts to start all over again and uh, to, uh, to put the ideal of Catholic education in place right from the outset and not have to fight the battle uh, as to whether or not we should be, uh, we should be uh, doing that. Uh, what uh, I am engaged uh, in here, this mini course, this introduction to moral philosophy, uh, is done under the aegis of what we're calling the International Catholic University. Uh, if you saw a series that appeared on EWTN a uh, short time ago, our Out of the Heart of the Church, you will have, uh, have uh, um, been apprised of, the, uh, of this coming effort. Uh, at the end of that series, I, I mentioned that I had been speaking with Mother Angelica and had uh, mentioned to her this fact, that if, if one could bring together in one place uh, all of the great teachers uh, on the various uh, campuses around the country, Catholic campuses, those who, who have no problem, who are enthusiastic about the ideal of the Catholic university as expressed in Ex Cordia Ecclesiae, if you could bring all those people together, the result would be just a, a, a magnificent university. And of course, it's, it's impossible to do that physically. But it occurred to me, and, and I, I, I came to talk with Mother Angelica about it, it occurred to me that you could do this by other means, by electronic means, by television, by, by other means that are, uh, whose operation is obscure to me, but I'm assured that uh, there are many more uh, uh, means of uh, conveying this sort of thing other than by having people in close physical proximity to one another that are just over the horizon. So I mentioned this to her and uh, we were there with, uh, with the president of EWTN, Bill Seltermeyer, and with Chris Harrington uh, and with others of the production staff. And after I'd uh, laid out this uh, idea, John Baker uh, was also there. Uh, Mother Angelica paused, and uh, I'm sure she was saying a prayer, and then she said, I like it, I like it, a corporate decision. Uh, and uh, out of that, uh, out of that uh, uh, agreement uh, fr uh, from her and her um, very generous offer to help us get started in this, we have been uh, forming over the intervening months since that meeting uh, this uh, International Catholic University. Uh, John Haas, uh, as well as John Baker, uh, is uh, allied with me uh, in this effort, and many others will uh, shortly be uh, joining us. The idea is that we will be giving accredited courses and uh, having degree programs, but uh, as well we want to have many courses of the kind that I'm uh, beginning here today, uh, introductory courses that run about, not just introductory courses, but short courses that run uh, eight hours and uh, which many people I think could be, become interested in uh, who are not uh, intending to gain a degree or to, uh, to uh, put a lot of these courses together for some professional purpose, but simply to uh, pursue more fully than they've had an opportunity to before uh, various intellectual, spiritual, theological, philosophical, uh, artistic uh, uh, trains of uh, so I began under that aegis. This is a mini course, we can say, uh, being offered by the uh, International Catholic uh, University. And it is, as I say, uh, devoted uh, to moral philosophy, an introduction to moral philosophy. What am I going to do over these eight hours? Let me just give you an indication uh, of the topics uh, of the, uh, today of course will be introductory and I've already begun that, but next time I will be placing moral philosophy within the larger context of philosophy. And the, the following uh, meeting, uh, the third lecture, will be concerned with ultimate end, the purpose of life, the end of human endeavor. Uh, next, in the fourth lecture, we'll be talking about virtue. Uh, we'll go on then to talk about the cardinal virtues in our fifth lecture. In the sixth lecture, we'll be talking about moral reasoning. And in the seventh, we'll be talking about conscience. Uh, and in the final lecture, we'll be speaking of the three fonts of morality, which play such an important role uh, in chapter two of the Holy Father's encyclical Veritatis Splendor. So th that's, the, that's the, um, uh, the plan, that is the terrain over which uh, we, uh, we intend uh, to, uh, to go. In this particular uh, first lecture, um, 
I'm, I'm going to be discussing four things. The first I've already discussed, that is to say something about uh, our effort uh, to bring together uh, electronically uh, great professors from the Catholic colleges and, and universities around the uh, country and to make them available as a single unified effort uh, to, uh, to those of you watching uh, such a program as this and by other means uh, in, in the future as the idea matures and uh, develops. So today, uh, the second point I, I will be taking up uh, is, well, the nature of philosophy. If we're going to have uh, eight talks on introduction to moral philosophy, uh, it's well to have some notion of what philosophy is, uh, of which presumably moral philosophy is a part. I then will go on and say a few words about the church's concern with philosophy. And this will address the kind of secularizing tendency uh, that I'm indicating, uh, I indicated earlier, talking about what's, what's happened, uh, at least to some degree, on uh, many of our uh, Catholic colleges and university campuses, the, the sort of uh, assumption uh, that uh, the mind is sort of neutral uh, with respect to uh, the faith, and it's best to keep it, uh, the, the two things uh, uh, separate. So we're talking about that. Why is the church interested in philosophy? I mean, it, uh, we might think of the question as, uh, why is the church, why, is, why would the church be interested in electrical engineering or something like that? And someone might uh, think that's a very odd juxtaposition of things, the Catholic Church and philosophy. It's important, uh, I think, for us to reflect at least briefly uh, on the significance of the church's interest in philosophy, not simply theology. And then finally, uh, in this lecture, I'll be reminding uh, those of you who need it uh, of the, uh, the fact of the Thomistic revival, uh, which was inaugurated by Leo XIII uh, at the end of the 13th century, and which uh, had such a magnificent history uh, up to mid-century, and then fell on uh, somewhat evil days, but which I think is now taking on new life and uh, you know, has a future, a very bright future uh, ahead of it. Not unlike the way we could say that after the Second Vatican Council, uh, there were days that were not particularly cheerful uh, in every regard, and we might wonder whether uh, the uh, purposes and aims of the Council were being implemented. Uh, certainly in some cases they, they, they were not. And uh, in 1985 at the Second uh, Extraordinary Synod, uh, we had the fathers of that Synod and the Holy Father uh, acknowledging uh, that uh, there had been a misinterpretation, very widespread misinterpretation of Vatican II, uh, that uh, it was necessary, uh, the fathers of that uh, extraordinary synod felt, to counter. It was just before that synod uh, uh, that uh, there was the famous interview uh, with Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, in which uh, he uh, sounded, as it turned out, many of the themes of that extraordinary synod. And now quite recently, uh, in uh, Veritatis Splendor, uh, we have the Holy Father uh, pointing out that many moral theologians, Catholics, have been misinterpreting uh, Catholic moral doctrine and uh, adopting positions which are simply untenable uh, as, um, as modes of, uh, of Catholic thought. So let's uh, then turn to uh, the, uh, the second large point of this uh, first lecture, and that is the nature of philosophy. I will um, remind you, of course, that the word is Greek, uh, and uh, it means uh, a desire, a quest, a love of wisdom. Uh, and this is not simply an accidental fact that it's a, a word derived from the Greek, so is biology. We might not think that's terribly important. But we will, uh, we will be talking a bit about the significance of what the Greeks meant by the term uh, philosophy and how what the Greeks did as philosophers is of abiding and perennial significance for anyone who does philosophy. We're going to talk now about uh, the nature of philosophy. You may have taken philosophy, and uh, this may serve as a reminder of uh, thoughts that uh, you haven't entertained for some years, uh, or you may not have uh, studied any philosophy. And uh, in either case, uh, what I'm going to be saying here is very elementary, and uh, it's not meant to be condescending, because I think all of us uh, are willing to listen to someone uh, else, at least, uh, making the effort to say obvious things about a certain discipline. Uh, 
that might be a definition of uh, philosophers, that they say obvious things that other people would be uh, somewhat embarrassed to say out loud. But I want to say something about the nature of philosophy and its beginnings in the sixth century uh, in Greece. Uh, by common consent, uh, the first uh, philosopher was Thales, and we know next to nothing about him. Uh, with the, three propositions which are attributed to him, but we have no, uh, no writings uh, of his. Uh, through that first, uh, those first centuries of philosophy, really the sixth and the uh, fifth century uh, BC, uh, we have efforts to understand the, the natural world, to move beyond the kind of storytelling or mythological account of what's going on in the world and to move towards what we could, I think, reasonably call a causal account. What is it in the natures of things? Uh, that explains their behaving in the way in which they do, so that to move towards uh, causal explanations is, in a sense, uh, a, um, a synonymous expression for a philosophical quest. Some of the early uh, accounts uh, strike us as being odd among them, of course, Thales. Uh, one of the propositions attributed to him is that everything is water. Uh, and uh, later philosophers tried to figure out why he would have said uh, uh, something like that, and uh, they suggest that, well, moisture and dampness seems to be uh, uh, involved in the generation of living things. Perhaps it was that. Uh, he also said that uh, all things have soul in them. Uh, and a third proposition attributed to him is that all things are divine. So he was a kind of uh, pantheist. Uh, we get a sequence of, uh, of uh, philosophers, Anaximenes and Eximander and so forth, who give accounts like, well, everything is air, and they're trying to figure out uh, what basic thing there is which takes on these different uh, manifestations and configurations and so forth, but it remains the same and it just looks different, has different shapes and forms. And they came up with different candidates uh, for that role until we reach Empedocles uh, uh, in the fourth century, uh, maintaining that, well, no, there are four elements, uh, building blocks of things, fire, air, earth, and water. Uh, and this was a theory destined to have a very, very long career. But uh, I brought us rather rapidly up to the fourth century BC. This is the golden period of Greek philosophy. Here we have a sequence uh, of three of the most remarkable men uh, who ever lived, uh, Socrates, uh, and following upon him, Plato. Much of our knowledge of Socrates, of course, comes through Plato. Socrates didn't write anything. And after Plato, Aristotle, who for 19 years studied in the Academy of Plato, and on the death of Plato, started his own school in Athens, the Lyceum. These three men uh, just define what philosophy is. Uh, Socrates comes through to us in the Platonic Dialogues as a very uh, thoughtful, a very engaging figure uh, who is very conscious of the fact that we are apt to claim to know things that we don't know. And uh, Socrates uh, is noteworthy for the fact that uh, he claimed that the wisdom that he had and that the Sibyl had uh, assured him that he had was not a matter of knowing uh, something that other people didn't know, but what set him off uh, and made him wise was the fact that he knew he didn't know anything. So there's certain uh, irony, of course, in Socrates, but that Socratic wisdom uh, is, a, is a, a kind of reminder of the occupational hazard of the intellectual life, and that is to pretend uh, to know what one doesn't know. But substantively, what we think of when we think of Socrates is the pursuit of questions like, well, what is piety? What is justice? What is friendship? What is loyalty? That is moral quality. Socrates says he was far, he was a townsman, an urban uh, person. He had been in the wars and come back, came, came back to Athens. And he was interested in human beings and the life of human beings and questions that all of us uh, have to address. And the mark of a Socratic dialogue on a moral question is that uh, they don't reach any definite conclusion. Now, when we turn to Plato, uh, the student, as we can say, of Socrates, certain, certainly Plato defines himself uh, with reference to uh, Socrates. With Plato, we get uh, a very engaging account of what it is that uh, enables us to know as human beings. And what, uh, what uh, Plato uh, can be said to have uh, uh, taken his inspiration from was this fact. Uh, let us say that uh, 
you devote yourself to the study of ladybugs, huh? uh, and you become the, uh, the northern Alabama expert uh, in ladybug, and you write the definitive book on the, uh, on the uh, subject with, of course, a very interesting chapter on the male ladybug, and you become, as I say, famous uh, for this particular thing, and you grow old, as old as I am, uh, and your research is long behind you, and your book is in its 15th printing and so forth, and some one of your grandchildren comes up to you and says, uh, you're the expert in ladybugs, Grandpa, and you say, indeed I am. And uh, he asks you what ladybugs you know all about. And you say, well, I know about all of them, ladybugs. And uh, this is a very persistent grandchild. And he asks, well, where are the ladybugs that you studied when you wrote your book? And you would say, well, where are the ladybugs of yesteryear? None of them is still alive. So he would want to know, what are you knowing if uh, all of the ladybugs that you studied uh, have ceased to exist? How do you know? Uh, that what you learned uh, from studying them is applicable, as you seem to think, being a grandfather, to uh, the ladybugs of this uh, culminating uh, generation. Plato pondered that, uh, that sort of question, and uh, he came up with an initially very surprising uh, suggestion. And it was this, when we know ladybug, we don't know these little particular things that come and go and flit around and, uh, and, um, and the like. We know the idea or the nature of Ladybug, and that is not lodged in any one of these individuals. That enjoys a separate and ideal existence elsewhere. And for Plato, this meant that the quest for knowledge, then it might be triggered and set off by our experience of the things around us, but it, the mind is drawn away from the things of this world towards those ideal entities. And in Plato, this quest for, uh, for knowledge, for truth, uh, is one that is at one and the same time an intellectual quest and a moral quest. In Plato, moral virtue tends to be uh, what we need in order to overcome the attraction of physical objects. Uh, so the moral virtues enables the mind to be released and to turn towards these ideal entities. That uh, Platonic doctrine is one that haunts and attracts and uh, uh, both positively and negatively philosophers to this very day. Uh, Whitehead said that all philosophers are either Platonists or Aristotelian. The way Gilbert and Sullivan thought, all little babies were born either little conservatives or little liberal. Uh, what is an Aristotelian? By contrast to Plato, Aristotle brings the whole thing back to this world. And he wants to say, look, the natures of things aren't somewhere else. We shouldn't be misled by our language and by, our, by the universal terms, the common terms in our language, and think that just as Phyto names this dog and Pluto names this dog, dog names some other thing other than these individual dogs. Uh, Aristotle suggested that our minds are such that uh, in intellectually knowing these individual things, we are fashioning in our mind a nature which they have, but they have individually. And we fashion it in such a way that it refers, and the name that signifies it, refers to all of these, uh, all of these singular things. You have there in that sequence of these three giants of Greek thought, and I'm, it's, it's a species of crime to try to sum, sum them up uh, this briefly, but I, I, I wanted simply to remind you if, uh, if that's what's going on or to give you some suggestion, uh, if you've not thought about these things before, of a century during which you had a, uh, one after the other these men asking questions which don't have any immediate practical uh, import, but go to the whole um, question of what it is that human beings having a mind ought to be doing uh, with it, and who come up with theories which are related to one another, but uh, tend to be such that, well, you, if you're a Platonist, you're not likely to be an Aristotelian and vice versa, or so it looked. Uh, uh, many, many later philosophers would want to say they want a little bit of both, and indeed, uh, Aristotle himself would be unintelligible. Uh, without, uh, without Plato. So there is a sense in which we can argue without being terribly irenic uh, that there is a compatibility between these, these uh, philosophies that follow one another, even though uh, Aristotle uh, tends to look like a very severe critic 
uh, of his master Plato. But then Plato was very critical of Platonism uh, as, as well. Now what happens when we turn to the Christian era? What happens? Well, how do the early Christians regard uh, this pagan effort? If we look to the fathers of the church, there are some of them who will say simply, the wisdom that the philosophers were seeking uh, in raising and pursuing the kinds of questions that I've, that I've uh, indicated, that wisdom is given to us in Christ so that we don't have to engage in that kind of uh, enterprise anymore. What they sought in vain or uh, sought in such a way that they achieved it in merely meager amount, we have been given in its fullness. Uh, in the faith. There were other uh, of the fathers, St. Basil, for example, uh, who had uh, been educated, as many of the fathers were, in the pagan system of uh, education. Uh, St. Augustine later is another uh, strong example of that, who began to see that, or began to suggest that there was some kind of complementarity, uh, some kind of mutual significance for faith and reason. And what I want to suggest to you is this, that the Christian era from the very beginning uh, can be looked upon as a ongoing conversation, dialectic, about the relationship between faith and reason. It starts with the fathers. Uh, it goes on in the dark ages. It goes on even when uh, the great uh, works of pagan philosophy were no longer available uh, or were available in only a few titles. During the Dark Ages, during the monastic period of medieval education, uh, when education was centered in monasteries and they had libraries even more modest than this one behind me, uh, which was filled with handwritten manuscripts uh, in which some of the treasures of antiquity uh, were um, preserved and passed on to others. During this period, Plato was known through a partial translation of one of his dialogues and Aristotle through a couple of his logical works. And I'll discuss the significance of that uh, when we return. Well, we uh, had uh, taken the history of philosophy very rapidly uh, from uh, the Greek period into the patristic period uh, and uh, had uh, mentioned that uh, during the Middle Ages, uh, while the <clears throat> conversation that I mentioned about the relationship between faith and reason went on, it went on without having available uh, the writings as such of Plato and Aristotle, except as I mentioned in one or two examples from the vast production of uh, each of these uh, men. What happened was that uh, the fathers uh, who had been instructed uh, in this literature and St. Augustine notably uh, conveyed indirectly uh, the uh, problems of philosophy to later believers uh, and their reflections on the relationship between uh, what ph philosophers had done and what uh, Christians believed. St. Augustine was extremely uh, susceptible uh, to Platonism uh, and uh, for a long time felt that Plato must have come into contact uh, with the Bible to have uh, said the things that he did about God and the nature of God and his difference from, uh, from uh, other uh, beings. But it's only in the city of God uh, that he acknowledges that uh, there's no basis whatsoever historically for thinking that Plato had any contact uh, with, uh, with the Jews, uh, had no uh, knowledge of the Bible and so forth. So this, this forced him or, or uh, led him then to see that the human mind untutored by the faith is capable of achieving just extraordinary truths. And what, uh, what uh, believers then tended to do, by and large, was to ask, well, what is the relationship between these truths uh, that human beings, any human being, believer or not, uh, can arrive at simply by using the powers that God has given us on the one hand and the truths that God has revealed to us about himself and ourself uh, on the other. And much of, of uh, the Christian era uh, is a matter of discussing that question one way or the other, coming up with uh, uh, slightly different emphases, uh, different uh, theories as to what that uh, relationship might be. But one of the giants, uh, as many of you will know, uh, in this effort is uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, who lived in the 13th century, born in 
1224 uh, and uh, died in uh, 1274. Perhaps he was born in 1225, but he was 49 or 50 years old when he died. But Thomas is a very important uh, figure uh, because he lives in the first um, generation of the universities. As a young boy, he studied at Monte Cassino, near where he was born, at Roccasecca in southern Italy. Uh, studied there until he was an early teenager, and then he went to the University of Naples, uh, where he met uh, some Dominicans and eventually joined uh, the Dominican order himself. And after a year of some commotion because of his family's opposition uh, to his vocation, uh, went north to study, first at Paris, where uh, the University of Paris, as I mentioned, is sort of the flagship uh, of the medieval university and indeed of the university. And after time, then he went to Cologne to study with uh, St. Albert the Great uh, and then returned to Paris and so forth. But the, uh, the point of mentioning this is that he is a university person. That is, we move beyond the monastic schools and the cathedral schools into this new legal entity, uh, which is the uh, university a kind of guild in which students uh, apprentice themselves to masters in order to become masters themselves, masters of theology, masters of scripture, uh, and uh, masters of the arts. Uh, but a feature that, I, that uh, I think we should remind ourselves of that's very important about this is that towards the end of the 12th century, towards the end of the 12th century, uh, there comes into Latin translation uh, many of the works of uh, Aristotle, which had hitherto been unknown. And this causes a tremendous commotion uh, in medieval education, because up to this point, uh, the discussion of the relationship between faith and reason had achieved a kind of stability. And it's permissible, uh, scholars argue about this, but it's permissible to call this a kind of Augustinian solution. Uh, and suddenly now you get this influx of literature, the Aristotelian literature, and that whole question is opened up again. And it's enlivened by the fact that uh, coming along with the translation of Aristotle uh, are translations of Arabic commentaries on works of Aristotle, where you have Muslims trying to figure out, well, what's the relationship uh, between what uh, the philosophers, the pagan philosophers uh, wrote and what we Muslims believe. You had Jews like Moses Maimonides uh, asking the same question. Uh, so there is a sense in which uh, the three great religions of the book uh, are addressing a similar question. Uh, and when it, uh, when it uh, comes up in a lively fashion at the University of Paris, uh, what Maimonides had had to say uh, and what uh, Averroes and Avicenna had had to say about uh, this matter had a tremendous influence uh, for, uh, for uh, better or, or, or worse. So this, uh, what we have in Aquinas uh, is uh, a, an achievement that, uh, that uh, stands. Uh, now that might seem odd to think that someone living all those years ago in the 13th century, uh, knowing so much less than we do, having so much less elegant indoor plumbing than we do, uh, could have come up with something uh, that we would say stands today. Uh, and of course, one would want to modify that uh, in, uh, in various ways. I'm talking about the, the essentials uh, of his thought. Uh, and that, uh, that, the, that his thought does have uh, this kind of continuing relevance uh, was made clear uh, by Leo XIII uh, in 1879 when he issued an encyclical uh, called uh, Eterni Patris of the Eternal Father, in which looking around at uh, the situation at the end of the 19th century, uh, it, uh, it was clear to Leo uh, that what, uh, what we had to do was to get back to the world vision uh, that had uh, dominated uh, in the Middle Ages and which had been uh, frittered away uh, to some degree uh, by modernity, leading to social and uh, epistemological difficulties of a, of a uh, horrendous kind. So here was Leo XIII in the late 19th century at a time when everything looked hunky-dory, I suppose, to the secular mind. It was just before things began to fall apart. Uh, Leo, with, with prophetic uh, vision, is seeing that the, the seeds of real disruption uh, and chaos are there in modern thought and that this has to be countered on the level of thought. This is what he had in mind. Uh, when, he, uh, when he urged Catholics to return to the study 
of Thomas Aquinas, not to return to the Middle Ages, not to hurry back into the 13th century, but to look at Thomas as, as a vehicle for ideas and arguments and outlooks which are of perennial relevance and uh, consequently could be of use in addressing the social and intellectual problem uh, which Leo XIII saw as characterizing the late 19th century as, so to speak, the fallout or the fruition uh, of the Enlightenment. Uh, we have arrived at a period uh, in intellectual history where it is commonplace uh, for people to recognize that uh, the Enlightenment uh, project has failed. When Leo XIII uh, said that, it was by way of uh, being uh, a surprise. Some people other than Catholics uh, listened to him, but by and large uh, his would have been a strange voice uh, to those who, as I mentioned earlier, thought things were going pretty well. But uh, things were soon to start going very badly, uh, and this led to uh, a generalized reflection as to the validity of the social and intellectual principles on which the modern world uh, had, uh, had been, uh, had been uh, founding uh, itself. The great difference, uh, and uh, I want to uh, conclude uh, this uh, general presentation of philosophy and why it is that the church is uh, concerned with philosophy, by contrasting, as I've done on other occasions, what seems to me to be the fundamental different outlook on the part of the classical philosophy coming from Aristotle, represented by St. Thomas Aquinas on the one hand, and modern philosophy, which takes its rise in, in Descartes on the other. And uh, without great uh, oversimplification, I think one can say this. The assumption of classical philosophy is that everybody already knows things for sure. You and I know truths before uh, we go on to uh, higher education, pursue the study of philosophy, and so forth. Uh, why is that uh, necessary to repeat? It seems obvious. Because the assumption of modern philosophy has been, from the time of Descartes, that what we think we know prior to the study of philosophy is confusion and error and intellectual chaos. And what we need is a method, uh, some uh, technique, that will enable us for the first time, for the first time as the result of studying philosophy to say, I know something for sure. Now that's an incredible uh, kind of assumption. I think it's uh, basically uh, incoherent uh, uh, as, uh, as, as well. But I think whatever you'll agree, it's a very dramatic kind of difference. So what the classical philosopher endeavors to do is to ask himself, what is it that we all know about a certain area, and then how can we advance beyond that common knowledge to greater and greater uh, penetration into the things that, uh, that, we're, that we're talking about that, uh, that are in question. But the, these starting points, these principles, are considered to be in the public domain. They're not the uh, possession of an elite, of a few sophisticated people uh, off someplace who are utterly different uh, from the mass of mankind. You can see the social disruptiveness uh, that is latent uh, in, the, in that uh, assumption. So now when we turn, as we will be uh, after these introductory remarks, uh, to uh, the uh, study of moral philosophy as such, we're going to notice that that is the technique that we will be pursuing. What is it that we all know about the moral order to start off with or think we know? And how can we, how can we find what's true in those original assumptions and what may not be, and then move on from there to get a better knowledge and, uh, and uh, clarity? Uh, about the moral order. I will be being guided uh, in this by Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, I have here Thomas's commentary on the Nicomachean Ethics of uh, Aristotle, uh, a book that has the great advantage of having both uh, the work of Aristotle's in it, uh, in complete, and Thomas's explanation or uh, uh, commentary on it, and of course I also have uh, the Summa Theologiae, that uh, great work of uh, Thomas Aquinas uh, in which he summarized uh, Christian doctrine and put it into relationship with, uh, with uh, natural knowledge uh, as it uh, was uh, at uh, his time uh, in the 13th century. And so when we return, I'll say a few more things about the significance from the point of view of the church of this difference in outlook between classical and uh, modern philosophy.
with respect to their conflicting assumptions about how we begin. I mentioned earlier that uh, it might seem to us odd that the church should have any views whatsoever about philosophy, and I use the analogy of, of the faith and electrical engineering. And one might uh, rightly uh, react to the juxtaposition of those two I was somewhat uh, uh, something of surprise. I mean, is there any particular thing that we'd want to say about electrical engineering from the point of view of, uh, of the faith? Uh, someone might think the same is true of philosophy, that this is just something that uh, people do in their leisure time and they ought to be left alone. It doesn't have any particular significance uh, for uh, the faith, so, uh, one way or the other. Well, if you think about the conflicting starting points that I'm uh, suggesting characterize, on the one hand, the classical philosophy represented by Thomas Aquinas, in which we as Catholics have been urged to uh, readopt and reanimate uh, by Leo XIII and all the subsequent popes, with the sole exception of John Paul I, for obvious uh, reasons. Uh, if you consider those conflicting uh, starting points, uh, you, you will begin to see, I think, that uh, there is something terribly important here for the church to take into account, and the church is likely uh, to wonder uh, as to which of these views uh, is compatible uh, with uh, Christian revelation, the great assumption of Christian revelation. Uh, what what uh, assumptions do I have in mind? Uh, it's obvious, uh, isn't it, when we think of the Gospels that uh, Christ is conveying uh, his message, the good news, uh, an extraordinary message, something that it would never have entered into the hearts of men to know uh, if he didn't tell us about it. He is telling us about it in a language uh, that is already being used for all kinds of purposes, for commerce, for making love, for disciplining one's children, for legislating, all of the usual uses of language. He's taking that same language uh, and uh, using it as a vehicle to convey uh, to us this extraordinary uh, truth uh, that uh, he is our salvation. Furthermore, if you think of the parables of Christ, think of the way in which he taught. He tells stories. Think of that most famous parable of all, uh, of the prodigal son, where we are asked to think of this uh, wayward youth uh, who takes his inheritance and he goes off to the big city, Birmingham probably, and he spends his substance on fast women and, uh, and uh, faster music, and uh, he's reduced to penury. Uh, and it occurs to him as he's uh, uh, verging towards homelessness that uh, the stock on his father's farm uh, are eating better than he does. Uh, and he decides that he will go back and offer to occupy the most menial uh, position uh, on his father's property uh, in order to save himself from this dreadful life that his uh, prodigality has, uh, has led him into. And the great surprise, his father sees him from far off. Uh, and he goes to meet him and kills the fatted calf. There's a great celebration. So uh, this is a wonderful story. We just uh, feel good, I think, every time we, uh, we think of it. But it's not just a story, is it? It's, it's meant to tell us about the mercy of God and our relationship to God. And we're supposed to what? We're supposed to think son or child, parent, uh, and the kind of love and, and uh, reliability that, uh, in the ideal case at least, we expect from our parent, and to project from that and to get some intimation of what our relationship is to God. Uh, and yet, it's, it's very different, but uh, the story is meant to be a kind of uh, stepping stone, a kind of springboard towards understanding what we otherwise would not understand. What does that whole uh, method of instruction presuppose? It presupposes that Jesus is talking to people who already know things. They already know lots of things. And he is going to presume that and try to attach to those things uh, new truths that they could not possibly have known uh, if he did not, uh, if he did not uh, uh, convey them to, to, to them. So the, um, the very evangelizing task of Christianity presupposes that People are in possession of truths, commonplace truths, about themselves and about the world, without which, you see, Christianity, the revelation, could not 
uh, be conveyed in the way uh, in which Christ chose to convey it. His very coming uh, to us, the very incarnation, the fact that, that uh, God became man in Jesus is meant to what? To proportion uh, him in some way to us so that we could see him a man uh, like us in all things save sin. And in that way, he can be a model for us, the way, the truth, and the life. Again, there has to be a kind of continuum uh, between what anybody can know, what anyone can see, and the further surprising truth of Christianity that, of course, can't be an achievement. It's not a matter of our discovering it. It's a matter of it being offered to it. To us, but I'm drawing attention to the way in which it is offered. It's offered to us in such a way that we see it as sort of uh, coming out of or being attached to, being complementary uh, to what we already know. Uh, that's a long story out of a short story, but the point of it is to indicate why it is that the church, as the custodian of revelation, has a stake in what goes on in philosophy. If, a, if it becomes a dominant view in philosophy uh, that uh, the world is something that we cannot know, that what we are knowing are rather our own constructions and construals and ideas rather than the things themselves, this has, uh, this has ramifications, I'm suggesting, uh, for the capacity of uh, the evangelizing capacity of, of the church. How can we convey uh, to others uh, truths which are meant to hook on to what they already know uh, if we are in the grips of a philosophy which argues that we don't know anything yet, that we are at best confused and bewildered and, uh, and immersed in, uh, in intellectual uh, error. It's for this reason uh, that the church has from the very beginning uh, in its educational efforts, in the monasteries, in the cathedral schools, in the universities, uh, been interested in all human learning, not simply the Bible and uh, reflections on the Bible. That was considered to be the crown, uh, the goal towards which education would tend, so that theology, that reflection on scripture, on revelation, was called the queen of the sciences. And philosophy, which stood, of course, for all, uh, humanly attainable truths was called the Anchilla Theologiae, the handmaiden of, uh, of theology, so that there was this notion of a, of a hierarchy. But uh, a hierarchy implies relationship between the uh, elements uh, that are uh, graded uh, within the hierarchy. So there must be a connection, a, a, uh, a uh, complementarity between philosophy and the faith. The church has always recognized this, and therefore it cannot be indifferent uh, to uh, bad philosophy, bad philosophy, and will promote uh, the study of uh, true philosophy because true philosophy will be compatible uh, with, with Christian truth. That is, of course, the great underlying assumption uh, of the church's concern, that uh, there are truths that are available to all of us, believer, and non-believer alike, and those truths are in principle compatible with the truths that God has revealed. To consider them as simply unrelated to one another, as at odds with one another, in conflict with one another, that is an unacceptable uh, notion of, uh, of the relationship between faith and reason. Why? Because the faith is something that is given to us by God, revelation uh, of these truths by God. Uh, on the one hand and on the other, our natural capacities, our minds, our imagination, which enable us to understand the world around us. So that uh, if you read the Psalms from this point of view, you're struck uh, by how often the psalmist looks out at the world uh, and sees it as expressing the glory of God or blessing God. So within scripture itself, it's the most commonplace thing in the world that we are being asked to look at this world, the world around us. The assumption is we know it, it's there and we know it, we see it, we understand it, and it becomes a, a kind of symbol and, uh, and model uh, of something beyond that we can't see and can't have, uh, have direct uh, experience of. So that to, to indicate that this isn't just a kind of intrusion of the church into an area that uh, doesn't concern her, but it's an area that the church cannot fail to be interested in and to promote and to urge uh, believers and of course everyone else uh, to pursue philosophical truth in the confident assumption uh, 
that anything that is discovered by the human mind will and must be compatible with what God has revealed uh, to us about himself uh, and the world. Now, much the same uh, is true uh, in our specific concern in these lectures uh, in moral philosophy. And we will see that one of the great themes of uh, Christian philosophy is this relationship between truths, practical truths, practical moral principles, which are considered to be in the public domain, uh, principles that we can assume that all of our interlocutors, anyone that we talk uh, with about these matters, will have in his possession. They're not our truths, they're not, they're not his, they're ours huh? uh, in, in common. And that these guidelines for human action are continuous with and compatible with the very specific uh, kinds of guidelines for behavior uh, that we as Christians uh, are given. So again, there is complementarity and not conflict, not, not opposition. This, uh, this you will uh, realize is one of the notes of, uh, of Catholic teaching, the, uh, the relationship between the natural and the supernatural. That is a variation on the theme that I say characterizes uh, the Christian era, the great conversation uh, on the relationship between uh, faith and reason. So we will be turning uh, in our next lecture specifically now to moral philosophy after these wide-ranging uh, discussions of uh, the history of philosophy and uh, where we are now uh, from the church's point of view uh, in the history of philosophy and what the task is uh, before us. And this course is meant to uh, give you at least a uh, quick barefoot trip through the terrain of moral philosophy as looked at through the eyes of a Christian philosopher.